Yeah. Hey, it's BT with Tales from a Gemini. You guys have no idea how happy I am to be finally back. I've been through it all, man. I came through, uh, I was diagnosed with uh, COVID, so uh, thanks, Melinda. I was diagnosed with COVID, and I'm um, just getting over it. I had COVID pneumonia, so I'm just happy to be here, and I mean it from the bottom of my heart. And, um, and while I was down, man, I saw this documentary of this guy I knew, flat track racer, named James Rispoli. And I saw this documentary, The American Dream, and I was like, man, I got to get this guy on. Because I like stories, man, a, a person's stories. And I don't care where you come from, your background, black, white, woman, or whatever. How you doing, my man? Good to see you, brother. Be safe out there, man. I mean that, bro. And, and I don't care who you are. A story is a story because we're all human beings, and that's what's, and that's what I think binds us to get uh, to binds us seriously as people. Why is it moving? Oh, because you're moving the screen. Okay. You're getting, giving me a vertigo. And so that's why I wanted to... <laughs> okay, I need five minutes. Okay, <laughs> just hold on. Uh, my guest just hit me up. And just click when you're ready. So, yeah, uh, yeah, so, uh, yeah, I mean, no, he just hit me up and said, uh, give me five more minutes. I said, okay. So, it's James Rispoli. He's a flat track racer. And this guy, this guy, two time AMA champion, AMA East uh, Super Sport champion, uh, AMA West Super Sport champion. But here's what I didn't realize, though. He just won the championship, flat track championship in 2020. Uh, for Harley Davidson, and is what I didn't realize is that he holds a, a a Bonneville speed record. I don't know if you know what the Bonneville speed record is. Wyatt, producer, nineteen years old, who don't not know anything, didn't know who Pearl Jam is. I mean, what they do? They go to Bonneville in in Utah, and certain and they set speed records. That's where everybody goes to set the la, the fastest uh, speed on land. And I mean, people have been killed there. And honestly, so they do a lot of speed records. Like sometimes it's uh, like a production bike. Uh, some people do like honestly, like just regular, like regular street bikes. They the fastest, like uh, bagger. You know, like you know, like the Harley kind of guys, whatever. They have some of the fastest baggers on earth. I've, I've ridden with a guy who set the uh, speed record uh, for I forget what category it was, but we rode together in Alabama. I mean, it's really interesting. And I passed it uh, when I was on my way riding out to uh, Sacramento on my, on my motorcycle, and I kind of wanted to just go out there on my bike. And do it, but, it, but that salt gets in your engine, man, and you're done. So I didn't, but that's that's so fascinating. Just think about it to go as fast as you possibly can. How fast is top speed? I mean, it, it depends on which. I mean, some people go 400 miles an hour and, and on, on, on different ca- categories. And there's, sometimes they're rocket bikes and everything. So, yeah, man, it, it's really incredible. They go 400. Yeah, I mean, ser- no, seriously, there's, there's rocket machines, like, my, uh, and they, they've gone 400 miles an hour on, sp- on land, man. And, and some, you know, some production bikes, like, say, a Harley, man, man go, like, 200 miles an hour. I mean, just, it, it, it's different categories, though. It's different categories. So, it's like, yeah, I don't want to speak out of my ass, but, yeah, there's different categories. So, it's unbelievable. I, I wouldn't mind kind of going. You know, like, I'm not really going to have a drag racer kind of guy, but I kind of want to go to see somebody go that fast. But then I don't want to see the, I mean, I say that, but it, a death can happen in anywhere. I mean, honestly, like, you know, the race tracks, were, but can you imagine going as fast as you possibly can? If I had to pre- predict the way you'd go out, I feel like that would be <laughs> towards the top of it. Well, thanks, Wyatt. I appreciate it. I don't know, man. I don't know. Why, why is Wyatt, Wyatt being so mean to me? <laughs> if you had to predict, that's not mean. That's just... If you had to predict the way I go out, that's probably would be it. Yeah, you traveling out there, trying to break a top speed, you hit like a, a, a pedal or something and go flying. And you go, well, there goes Tales from the Gemini. <laughs> 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 well, there's one show down. <laughs> you guys have to put my, just the picture up. We're so hard to say goodbye. I know, man. Uh, but you know what? I say that, but if you go out doing something you love, but people say That's that. What I was gonna say. But if you say that, but like, what if that last second is like, ah! you know what I mean? Like, I don't want to be like in the casket, like you know, <laughs> your your face is all like, ah! you know, it's like because <laughs> you you know you're about to hit really fast and your heart's like, oh, we're gonna die. So, but I don't know. We don't know though. But we don't know how it is at last. People say that, and honestly, I, I kind of believe it because at least you're happy doing. But there's that oh shit moment. You're like, uh oh. You know what I mean? Like. I don't know. We don't know how it is, but I imagine that it's like, uh oh, you know, shit, you know what I mean? Like you're about to fall, shit, and that's it. Your last one, shit, like that, you know what I mean? So yeah, but I guess if you, but if you had to pick how you're going to go out, how how would you go out? If you had to pick, how would I go out? Yeah, playing basketball. 
In my sleep. In your sleep? I think everybody wants to go out in their sleep. How great would that be? Yeah. You're in a dream, and all of a sudden you wake up, and there's that white light, like, oh, man. But it's like, at least it didn't hurt. You know what I mean? At least, yeah. it, at least you're like, oh, you look all peaceful. Like, oh. And I didn't see it coming. Like, I want to... I wouldn't want to see it coming. Yeah, I don't want to see it coming either. I want it to hit me like a like a like a Ray Lewis, you know, come across the middle, and you think he's on the other side, and just when you realize, hey, where's Roo? and that's your, <laughs> and that's your last, your last word, where's Roo? and he just hits you, and and everything fades to black. Yeah, and it's just that, you know, that, you know, like I've been I've been pat, knocked out, not knocked out before, but I've been like when I was doing jujitsu, and I and I I got choked out, and it didn't hurt, and I was out for like this, and I swear to God, they woke me up. And it's the greatest sleep you'll ever have. I mean, I, I, like I literally, you know, you wake up going, and that stuff is on your on your teeth, and you're like that, and you're like, whoa, that's how it feels. Like I got choked out, and I woke up like, okay, I'm good. I mean, if it, like it didn't hurt, it felt good. I mean, it felt good, but it felt like a good sleep. And you're only out for like two or three seconds. Yeah, that's crazy. And I remember like everybody, all I see is these heads going, "Wake up, sunshine!" And I was like, "Huh?" And then my instructor was literally wrestling somebody. He was, you know, in the middle of a fight. And he looked over, he goes, ah. <laughs> and he started laughing at me, pointing, laughing. And he just kept on fighting. <laughs> yeah, it was funny. Your, your guess is here. Oh, he is. Okay, here we go. My guest, James Raspoli, is going to be on. Here he comes. Here we go, James Raspoli. It's my, fa- it's still my favorite part. I love it. Here, we- here we- James, what's up, buddy? James, can you hear me? Yeah, I got you. What's going on, man? Hey, first of all, man, thank you so much. And I mean it's from the bottom of my heart because, I mean, I know you, but I don't know you know you. You know what I mean? And, and, I, and I'm, I annoyed you in Laguna years ago. I remember yeah. that. <laughs> Look, he remembers that. And, and I, just, <laughs> I love it. Yeah, I remember you. Trust me, I remember you. <laughs> but <laughs> I mean it from the bottom of my heart. But man, tell you something, man. I'm, I'm just getting over COVID. And I was going through and I was, you know, on lockdown, quarantine in my own room. So and I see this the American Dream documentary, and I'm I'm I'm, I'm not gonna lie, no bullshit, man. I'm just bawling in my room because I no because it's like I because I love the journey because I met you so and I, I don't care what anybody thinks about me. I want everybody to do well. I want everybody to win, and I mean it's from the bottom of my heart. And I see that, and I love the journey you did, man. From you know like you said, having it all. And then it's taken away. And now, man, you're on the road back. And, dude, I'm so happy for you. But the, before we even ask you a question, I want to know, why did you make Bradley Smith sleep in a duvet in the back of the zoosh? That's what I want to know. Dude, that guy is so humble, man. I, uh, I I gave him my bed and he didn't want to have it. So I was like, listen, man, you're my guest. You know, like MotoGP, X, Y, and Z. You know, yeah. Bradley Smith. I'm like, dude, take the bed. It's cool. I'll sleep on the couch or whatever. And Bradley's just not that guy, dude. He was like, no, it's all right, whatever. You know, I'll just sleep on the ground. He took a duvet, wrapped up, and slept on, the, <laughs> slept on my floor in the freaking Zoosh, man. So it, that was uh, – I had a lot – I've had a lot of fun times with Brad. And uh, the coolest thing about him is he's so humble about it. And, you know, it's so easy to relate with him. So, yeah, he's helped me a lot over the years, especially when I was in Europe. Man, yeah, you can't get any better than Bradley. And I mean it from the bottom of my heart. The same way here. When he was, uh, 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 he hit on, on his Twitter, he goes, it was between uh, GP and Austin and, and, and Argentina. And they had that, that weird weekend off. And he goes, what's everybody doing? And I said, hey, man, I'm doing a show in Dallas. And he and his dad came up and saw my comedy show. I mean, that's how cool he is, right? Yeah, no, he's good, man. He's good people. He's always helped me out. Um, even when I first went over there, his parents uh, has always let me stay at their house and whatnot. And he was really kind of the guy to like get me in touch with all of his friends in England and things of that nature when I was there. So I, I got nothing but great words to say about Brad. Um, we've done a lot of pedaling. Uh, I used to go to a lot of his races and help and, uh, you know, just kind of be his right hand man um, just in the corner watching stuff because we're both racers. And he helped me. He taught me a ton about data and stuff like that. I used to sit in his debriefs, which they were really cool about and just kind of just absorb it for my own. Uh, you know, he was so good about helping me, you know, like learning the, the data size at that super high level so that I've learned, uh, you know, pretty good amount for when I come back to the racing that I do. So I can't I can't say anything bad about Brad. Um, really, really great guy. 
Well, when are you guys going to do the eight-hour Suzuka? When are you guys going to be teammates? I mean, that's what, he, that's what he told me. He goes, man, ask him when we're going to do the eight-hour Suzuka and be teammates. And yes. I thought he meant me, but he meant you. <laughs> yeah, no, seriously, dude. Like, we have talked about a ton of stuff, you know, and the season goes further. Like, my other buddy, Kieran Clark, he was in the World Championship and, uh, you know, in World Super Sport and stuff like that. <laughs> we always talk about Suzuka. We always talk about putting in every single year. We're like, listen, we're just going to build a team. We're going to do it and whatever. We don't even care. Like who we just don't care. We're going out and we're doing it. And uh, that's somebody I would love to do it with. You know, I haven't rode a road bike in over a year, but I would love to do a couple wild cards in BSP. And I would love to do Suzuka and just couple like select things here and there. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, like that's, I can see Brad starting to do his own team and stuff with the kids. Yes. I want to try to get involved in that. And there's so many cool things that are now starting to intertwine where it might not be far off for us to raise a little bit of funding and do a Suzuka one off would be pretty cool. Dude, if you did that, man, all I want to do, let me just come in and polish the helmets. That's all I want to do is come in, wipe the helmets down, get a team shirt, and I'll act like, look, I can stand like this and look like I know what I'm doing and look at the screens like, like I can do that. And I would do that for you guys, man. To go over and help you guys, well, act like I'm helping you guys out. I, I would do my own, I pay my own dime. I just want to wear a team shirt. And, yeah. and you guys know how much of a geek I am. And I would literally just be like looking at the screens, act like I'm doing it, and do one of these things and kind of tap dude on the shoulder and act like I'm saying something so when the camera's little hitting point, me. Little point, little like, point. Yeah. Hey, look. <laughs> And they go, who's this guy? You know what I mean? I mean, we would get so much pub. They go, this, this team is diverse. They got, oh, I don't know who this guy is, but he obviously knows what he's doing. And this guy, I mean. We'll get you a clipboard. <laughs> and that, that on top of it. So you, you know what I mean? Because we don't even need him anymore. But just so you know, like pit stops are going oh well. And do that. Anytime you click something, they go, this guy knows what he's doing. If you're clicking something, they go, this little, guy knows. Yeah. And, and like this, and kind of like this, and like this, and then and come over and, hit, and do that little on, 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 on the shoulder, and you go like this, and they go, oh, this guy definitely knows what he's doing. Who is this guy? And I, I, I we'll get you a radio. We'll get you a radio just so you can, you know, <laughs> you two PSI down on the rear tire. <laughs> They would, I get a whole new career just looking like looking like I know what I'm doing. They go, this guy is good. We gotta oh, yeah. hire him. <laughs> I love it. Dude, I'm in. I'm in. So that that's just, let's just consider that part done. You're hired. Dude, so, oh, thank you. See what I mean? That's why I love this guy. I already got a new job, man. Already. Triggers. triggers are being pulled right now. Listen, <laughs> you know, acting team manager for this Suzuka deal. I'll pull the trigger. That's, that's how easy it's done in racing. That's how easy it's done. We talk about it. Next year, I got a new career. All because we just talked about it. I look like I know what I'm doing. I love it. I, love it. I know Brad would be on board a thousand percent. Well, let's get back to you, man, honestly. And let's talk. I want to go back to the beginning, beginning, beginning. Because watching all your interviews and watching what you do, you have this mentality. And I don't know, when you were growing up, did you do all, uh, all other sports? Like, like, what other sports did you do? Yeah, so I did, like, indoor soccer, outdoor soccer. I played a ton of hockey, um, lacrosse. That's it. I didn't do basketball or football, but... Yeah. I, oh, I wrestled a little bit. That's so it. Like, That's it. Cause I told Brandon Posh when I when I was in England, I said, hey, man, you got to get a wrestler's mentality. And I don't know if it helped. But I mean, he won the Daytona 200. So and I said, you got to adapt the wrestler's mentality where wrestler's mentality is when you're down, you're going to be down and you just got to fight and you got to find a way to win. And I'm watching your interviews and it sounds cheesy as shit, but I'm a cheesy dude. And I was watching interviews and it's like. Like I said, you you know you were high and you got to the lows, but it's just like it's like a wrestler. You found a way. You got an escape, and then you got a takedown, and then all of a sudden you got a stall and calling your opponent. And that's where I related to wrestling. And I was like, this guy had to wrestle. And that's why. And honestly, I was watching the interview and I go, this guy used to wrestle. I can just tell by your mentality. Yeah, I was pretty young, but my brother wrestled all the way up to college and things of that nature. So I've always been in a family that's been like it's always been performance driven. So. Um, that's probably helped me and hurt me in some other areas, but more help than hurt. Um, you know how that goes when it's performance driven, you know, you, nothing's really ever good enough. You know, right. it's like, you know, you, you win a race and it's like, okay, what's the next, you win a championship. It's like, okay, what's next? You know, whatever it is, you get a hundred thousand dollars sponsorship. You're like, all right, well, I need 25 for this. Like nothing's ever like, who this was awesome. Like, thanks. You know, cool. Awesome. Pat on the back. Like there's just, you don't have that. So Maybe it's a little bit lonely at some times, but what it 
that's helped me a ton with that wrestling mentality. You know, the Goggins mentality. You know, yes. Like, just go. You got to just start and go. And, you know, when you think you don't have enough, you always have something else because your body is so good at reserving. It's like that's what it does, you know. And I'm not saying I'm the best at it. Right. But, you know. I learned a ton. And I mean, I'll say the number one thing, if you want to find some fire in your belly, the number one way to find it is just go broke. Cause you got one way, you got one way to go. You either going to sink or swim. And that's kind of what happened to me is I, like, I went broke, no rides. And it was like, okay, I can leave the sport, go like into real estate. You know, my family's in there. I could probably be pretty successful right away, make some money, this. So there was two options for me and it was, the thing, the problem was I still had the end goal was to try to get back on a bike. Right. And so it was like, all right, I got to, one was I got to leave, go make as much money and then buy my way back in and say, kind of like everybody pound sand. I'm just, I don't care about you anymore. I don't want to be dependent on any team owners or anything. Right. And, And, or, you know, I rally around and start from the bottom and come back. And literally, I had to leverage my entire integrity and my not my integrity, my uh, my entire uh, like, uh, you know, relationships over the years to try to get, hey, I need like, hey, I'm calling that favor in from 2009 when I won a championship. Yo, hey, I need something. Can you help me out? You know, those type of things that you never call on. And this was the day to call on all of them. And that's kind of how it all started back again. So. Um, it was dream. It was a dream season last year. You know, it doesn't always pan out that way. Yes. Um, even if we would have finished third in the championship, it would have been a dream season from where I came from. You know, if we finished fourth and we had, you know, a couple wins, it doesn't, it really just, the, the icing on the case was to win a lot and to get back to like my super sport days, mm-hmm. which I knew I could, yeah. but going back to that mentality, um, you know, I had such a good group of people behind me that that's really what helped, but I totally understand what you're saying and you got to just be able to pick yourself back up. And that's the hardest thing. And, you know, even go back to Bradley, I mean, you know, he's been in similar situations. So it was so easy for me and him to contact and relate and to, you know, Hey dude, like, you know, when do we stick our ground and when are we going to be submissive and when are we going to, you know, so it was really good to kind of have something like that because he's a very unique perspective in any championship because yeah. he has a very, very uh, straight outlook. Um, so you can tell him something and he's going to be like, he's going to give you the good, the bad, or the ugly, whether you want to hear it. And that's yeah. what I like about Brad, you know? You know, I, honestly, and I, I, I related to you on that. And what you just said is that, man, I, you know, I went to the, the same thing and I had it all and lost it. And I literally was selling. I don't know if you remember the old CD days, the Columbia House CD days where, you, you know, you get the, like 12 CDs for, for a penny. And yeah. no one here really knows if you were born after like 19, whatever, you don't understand it. But, you know, coming up, you get 12, you buy 12 CDs for a penny. And I had I must have had over 100 and it got so bad at one point in my life. I literally was selling those CDs so I could so I could eat. And I was and, and I, you know, because ramen noodles were like 10 for a dollar and I must have had 30 ramen noodles. I would sell all those CDs. And so when you said that and, you know, you lost all you had to come back up and, you know, when you're broke, you found out how tough you are. And that's where I went. Bam. I know. Ex- I mean, you know, yeah. I know exactly where I you're coming from, away, you know, and like, I mean, yeah, I mean, like I rode for Michael Jordan Motorsports. I rode for, you know, Keith Flynn. I rode for some very high level teams in Europe and, you know, like it became you know, almost too comfortable. And sometimes you gotta, you either gotta get beat down to either find your fire again, because it was just, you know, I kind of lost my way a little bit, you know, like it was like, I'm always going to be here, you know, and uh, like, (laughs) but you're not like, and you just get a little complacent. You start rolling your foot off the gas and you're like, ah, something will come. Something will come. And dude, sometimes it never comes. Yes. And that's what happened. It didn't come. How did you, just left. How did you get complacent? Like what happened where you kind of, eh, I'm good. Or like, wh- did you see it coming until it was too late or, or what happened? Like, how did you get complacent? It's just, it's tough, man, because, you know, like I was in a place where I was like, I won't ride around competitive bike, but when you look at opportunities, right. So, you know, it's, 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 it's really difficult. Cause like I had a goal of being in an international championship and riding against the best guys. So yeah. my goal was to get the BSB, right. The British super bikes. 
And when Keats thing kind of started floundering down and wasn't really going to move forward for 600s, I should have stayed one more year in 600s and had a shot at going for a championship there before I moved up. But there wasn't an option. And a lot of people, there wasn't quite the funding. And there was a BSB ride that looked amazing. Mm -hmm. And it probably would have been better if I was in a different uh, age bracket. You know, like if I was now doing it, it might have been a different outlook. And, um, you know, things might have been different. But, uh, you know, I took an opportunity that I thought looked amazing. Um, It wasn't quite the right move, whether because I was too young or because, you know, there wasn't quite the right equipment. But anyways, it just didn't work out. And that started the kind of spiral of, you know, chopping the, the tree down, you know, it was just one at a time. The next year, get on a bike thinking it's going to be good, another bad year. And then another bad year, and you're like, I got to get back on a good bike. But the problem is, is when you start your ride, you know, your net worth, your rider worth starts going down. And people just, even though you got hype around you, are like, hmm, you know, can you do it? You know, and then the rumors, and then this, it's like, he can't ride a, a thousand, he can only ride a 600. And anyways, it took all the way until 2018 to kind of build that confidence back up. And that's where it kind of made the stand saying, I'm not going to ride, you know, a bike that's uncompetitive here. And I'll leave. Like I left, you know, uh, battling for podiums at seven podiums that year. And I left. So it, it's kind of how the foot rolls off the gas, but I made a stand. And as well as that stand pushed me in a direction of not having anything, you know? So it's wow. a, it goes hand in hand and, you know, it then, you know, the realization when I get back to America, I have nothing here. I sold it all for five years. Right. Right come back to America, don't have a car. I've got five grand in my bank account. And like, I can't race because a bike costs to build is 14, 15 grand in dirt track. I lost the last ride here in road racing. And it's like, what am I going to do? You know, am I going to go down the road race path here in America, which doesn't look too tasty for me. Right. They're struggling. You only had Cameron making money. You got nobody making money. And it's like, okay. So even if I win, I'm not going to make money dirt track okay if i win there's good contingency there's good you know some good rides available there's still some factories involved maybe i haven't lost it all there and that's kind of what happened and you know like it even goes further wow. back <laughs> wow. i had to uh, I, like my buddy kieran clark is it does a lot of uh you know behind the scenes uh, camera tracking and I'm involved in that. So we were on, we literally on a Mark Wahlberg film in Mexico where he's, uh, you know, threw me a bone because I needed some money. I was dying, right? Yeah. Threw me a bone and said, hey, man, come out, be an uh, e-tracker technician. You know, I'm a ricer. I'm not a technician, but I'm there. <laughs> yeah. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm moving cameras. I'm taking it off, you know, 14 hour days doing this, you know, you know, life of, you know, a camera tracker. You know, it's awesome. Good money. And then and there, he's like, listen, man, you're going to Daytona. I'm helping you get to Daytona. And that's kind of what started the, the wow. thing. Wow. You know, because I was at my lowest, man. I wasn't <gasps> really in a good place. Wow. I mean, th- th- did you ever think you'd get back, though? I mean, even though, like, mentality strongly, I mean, when you get to the lowest, did you ever think you'd ever get back? So I knew, here's the thing, is, like, my riding ability, like, I was on the podiums. My last year in BSB, I was on the podiums. So I wasn't, like, I was, I was so torn because it wasn't like I'm done racing because I can't. I'm not competitive. Like I will not do it the day I'm not competitive, like consistently, right. you know, if there's no light I'm done. Like, I don't want to be here doing that. Right. Um, but I was like on the podium, you know, I've raced some dirt track. I got some decent results. I'm like, I don't understand how I can just be done. Like, you know, like I've got championships. I got that. Like, I mean, how I raced for like 24 years in a row and like, I'm going to be done. I'm not going to start the season. I'm like, it's not happening. Like I got to roll the dice one more time. The other two times I rolled the dice, I won two championships. And that's kind of how, like, it was all the same scenario. I was broke going in. I had made some money off of, like, contingencies. I kept the train rolling, won a championship, backed it up. And it's, like, the same thing kind of happened again where I was going in, broke. (laughs) And this time it took a lot longer, though. It took an entire, you know, 12 to 13 months, really, to... And those are long, that's a long 12, 13 months, I bet. 
dude, it was it was rough because you know, like you, you you have to do your own work. I had a lot of good friends behind me, you know, that were helping me financially, you know, support wise, labor wise, because I couldn't do it myself. My buddy bought me that fifteen hundred dollar van. Yeah, the you know, silver bullet. Stuff. Yeah, yeah, silver bullet, dude. <laughs> that was a game changer, you know. And like we joke about it now, and I'm like, I wish I had that back because one, it wasn't bad, a little deal, but it was just a good reminder to know, like, hey. Yeah. Like I was embarrassed to drive it and I shouldn't be, you know what I mean? Like right. she embraced it. And like, there's a, you know, it was literally it took me the mentality to go, Hey, it's cool not to be out of the big rig right now. Like, like use it, use that fire. And you know, it's, it's tough, man. It's not easy. It is tough because the light is very small and there's, you just get beat down every single race and you, you know, I was like in the talk, I show, I was showing up on an uncompetitive bike. I couldn't win. It was impossible, <sighs> you know, unless yeah. there was a rain race and dirt track, that doesn't happen. Yeah. So it was just one of them things. It was a grind dude, but <sighs> you got to do it. Right. I mean, honestly, and, and that's like, how low, if you want to talk about it, I like, how mm. low did it get? And even now, do you look back sometime and get like that little thing of anxiety? Like, and say if you see the Super Bowl or you like, or something reminds you of like, oh, that low place. Like, do you ever get a little bit of anxiety? Like sometimes? See, yeah, I don't know. Cause I don't really, like anxiety is a weird thing for me. Like, cause I don't really say like I have, I probably do, but I don't really know what that feels like. You yeah. know, like. I don't, I don't know what, like how to describe like anxiety for James Rispoli. Cause I'm either like, you know, if it means like, I feel like I either get complacent and I'm like, Oh dude, I gotta go. I gotta go. So yeah. I always keep running so yeah. that I don't try to get it. And now that I've learned what complacent is that it's like, anytime I'm like, all right, I can take a, uh, you know, a day off now, but gas has to go back on tomorrow because I can't allow the train to stop. So <laughs> It's a. Uh, it's now I've learned that that I won't allow it to happen again. Yes, I mean something, something like David Goggins talked about. I think you know, it, you just can't let that complacency hit. And I feel you on that one, man. It's like I feel the same thing too. It's like, man, I, I got to get going here. I got to get because if not, I always felt if you keep moving, then it it it, it somehow it, it it forces things to the, the, the order to, <laughs> to get yeah. right. You know. No, I totally agree with you there. It's like even if you move one step, it's you did you moved. Yeah. And like, that's my outlook is as long as we're making one step forward all the time, I'm okay with it. So, and I'm okay with going backwards as long as we make a step forward, you know? So it, for me, it's a little different than I need to make these big gains. I've learned a lot of little gains are big Yeah, and it's different than, you know, looking for the big ones. I don't even look for them anymore. You know, we've had them, but they come because you present opportunities. And something that I learned actually playing a little bit of golf is, um, you got to present yourself with like birdie opportunities, right? Yeah. And I'm not a great golfer. I shoot mid nineties. So I'm like, I can only lose two balls around. So I'm not, <laughs> I'm not a good golfer. But yeah. Good yeah. enough to understand that if you present yourself with enough birdie opportunities, <laughs> yes. one of them is going to go in. Right? Yeah. yeah. And so that's you. my outlook now is just present yourself with the opportunities, even though you lose, yeah. just as long as you got the opportunity, you've made the right choices to get there. And it's like, okay, one of them will work and then maybe it'll spiral into something. Good, that, great. That's a great outlook. I mean, look, okay, so at, at the height, man, like when you're over in England and Keith Flynn is fronting the team, anybody know who Keith Flynn was? It uh, was, uh, the God rest his soul, was the lead singer Prodigy. And how crazy did it get? If, if, you, if you can go down to like any stories where, how crazy did it get? Yeah, so there was, it was, so the team went through like, uh, like two, three phases, right? It went through really. <laughs> The first phase of like, hey, come over and stay with me for about 10 days and let's just hang out and see. We ended up making the deal. I rode the last round in Superstock 1000, did pretty well. So the deal was done. Um, the second phase was the start of the team on uncompetitive Suzuki's, <clears throat> you know, Keith as a rock star, being a rock star, you know, things of that nature where, <laughs> you know, the team was almost, almost started to go to veer down as like a joke because it was, you know, dude, he's a rock star. And, you know, like he doesn't do it on purpose, but he's a rock star. And so things happen as rock stars do, you know, <laughs> we had the hottest umbrella girls, we had the, the, you know, the best stuff. And, you know <laughs> so, you know, like, so we went down that path and then 
Keith was like, you know what? This is not what I want. I want a professional path. We got on Yamahas. We got competitive bikes. And that was when the second year hit. And he said, James, this is your meal ticket. You know, I'm supporting you to the end here. Uh, here's, here's your go at it. And that's when we got the best bikes, this, and, you know, Keith spent a ton of money. I lo- I literally owe so much to that guy because I wouldn't have the, the UK following or the longevity without him, you know, because he picked me to ride for him, you know, England instantly accepted me. My following instantly went through the roof and he taught me so much about him being humble, a showman, and how to deal with different things, you know, from being a rock star is like the highest level you can get. Yes. And so I learned so much from that guy and I owe him, you know, owed him like a ton, you know, and, you know, we just, I don't know what it was, but ever since I met him, we just always had this weird connection where we were just always like super cool, no matter what, any circumstance, it was like, he just treated me like, you know, I was his, you know, his brother more or less, you know, or best friend. We just, I don't know. It was a weird deal, but, uh, um, yeah, I owe Keith so much, so much for my UK. Well, I think it's because you're kind of like a rock star on the, I mean, seriously, the, your attitude to everything and it's like, oh, his Rispoli's here. And you, you bought that energy in that good energy, you know, to like, man, I like this dude. Who is this guy right here? So it was almost synonymous that you're like a rock star. It, but rock stars anyway are like motorcycle racers, you know what I mean? And then you meet an actual rock star and you can't, it's like, you can't help but like, bam, you know, like, like Legos, like this, this two piece. Fit. stick together yeah, yeah, yeah. Dude, and it's crazy because like i'm the type of person that's like if there's a level like i'm at that level you know of like if there's a vibe i'm there so like if the if the if there's no ceiling on it yeah i'm just i continue to go up you know and i like that feeling of uh you know just ha- everybody having a good time everyone laughing you know the drill like when people are laughing there's nobody having a bad time exactly you know? yes and it's like it's energy that you you just feel like it's always it like it's you just feel it inside like if you that person's smiling having a good time you feel it it elevates everything just keeps elevating yeah. and you know it just translates into a good time so uh yeah i mean it was like the highlight of my i would say that was probably the highlight of my uk was the second year um andy reed is my teammate we were such rivals at the time, but now we're like best friends. Right. And we were like, we look back and we're like, man, why were we such dicks to each other? <laughs> you know, like yeah. we were like, we used to race the, so hard uh, with each other. And we always used to be next to each other. We had completely different setups, completely different this. And he could start in 20th. I could start in first. And by lap three, we're like this. And we raced the entire race and it was just both of us. And it was, it was awesome. It elevated us. And, you know, I think that helped me is I've, I've had so many like super talented teammates that I've always had to elevate my game and I've always had to rise to the occasion. Um, you know, it feels like, you know, like, you know, I think maybe that's, uh, uh, you know, one of the cool things is like, I'm not the super most talented. I'm not the like ultra gifted. I'm not the Marquez, the, you know, the Andy Reid, the, uh, you know, Dalton Gauthier over here in dirt track or the Briar Bauman, who is so super talented, could ride anything as fast as they ride, you know, their factory bikes or whatever. You know, for me, it's like the Goggins, you know, I need a thousand laps yeah. behind them to understand it, to learn it, but then I can learn it and then use it against and then go, okay, let me see if I can translate it doesn't you know it takes a long time but if you're willing to do the work it kind of can happen you know and there's there's weirder things that have happened well i'll ask you what was it like because my first track when i went over there for vacation two years ago was cadwell park tell me what was the jump like if anybody know i'm talking about there's a jump it's the only road uh, road racing track where it's it's almost like a super cross jump where you see road racing bikes leave the ground and if you got to see it in person i remember being in in, in my first time there everybody's on the countryside i'm like whoa and the entire they all looked at me like who's this guy oh that's what i'm talking about yes oh (laughs) what was it like the first time tell me what that was like it was crazy, man. Like it was insane because it's not actually like you don't get a straight run up it. So yeah. you go, you go into this super tight G'd out chicane and it's first gear. 
Like, so that everybody has this mistake of like, it's a fast deal. Yeah. It's like you run into this corner, you G out the front end, you go through a tight left and you almost turn back on yourself. Yeah. Onto the grass. So you don't clip the curb. Right. And then literally when you go up, you're turning the entire time. I've seen it. You you can't go straight. So when you lift off, it's so weird is like, if you hang up, stay on the left-hand side, it's way left or way, uh, uh, not as peaky. If you go to the right, it's like, a jump and the crazy thing is the first couple times you're just like wheelie over it raw and you just try to find your line because if you go straight you're in the grass yes instantly. yes instantly. and if you don't hold the gas on you jump off the inside of the track because it forces you right so the crazy thing is is committing to it and getting speed <laughs> and when you feel on a 600 at least even on a thousand both wheels come off the ground it's pretty insane <laughs> because it, they're not supposed to leave. So like if you come off and you like balk a little bit, yeah. you come down and the thing's just tying itself in knots and you're just trying to hang on because you got a short little strip before you, you know, back shift and go through the tightest S's ever where you're just manhandling it. I would say it's, uh, it's super insane. But um, it's not as crazy as people think. Yeah. But when you do it at speed, or if you're like Josh Brooks that just launches it, or Danny Buck, and that they are so good over. I, w- I wish I could just get one pick that I could just repost every single year. <laughs> Cadwell goes around like that's this is my best picture, and it looks cool. But those guys are like Johnny Ray looking over the fans like what are you guys doing? It's insane. I, I've been there and I know the feel. And if anybody gets a chance, go to Cadwell park. I promise you, it, I, I don't think it's the best try. I like Donington personally. And my, I don't my favorite, but man, Cadwell, the jump alone. And it's such a beautiful, the English tracks are so small and tight, but that jump makes the whole trip worth it. And there's like when I, this year they just announced they're going to have fans again at all the tracks. I don't know exactly what the rules are, but at Cadwell specifically, the entire, the hill on the front straightaway and the back track is filled. It's like going yeah. to a festival. Yes. It's so amazing going to some of those UK tracks. I think Olton Park is probably the hardest track out of them all. Yeah. Um, it is so, has so much undulation. It's crazy. It's got like every American track you can think of in one, you know, Shell Oils is like Daytona. You've got, you know, bumpy stuff or downward like road atlanta you've got road america uphills i mean you have every single thing in america at olton park and it's like impossible to set your bike up it is just it is it's crazy so all the tracks were insane um first one i ever went to was snetterton which is probably the closest thing to america yeah the second one my first ever race was brands hatch and the only thing I can say about Branch Ash is like turn one feels like you're falling off a cliff. Turn two feels like you're going to hit a triple. Like turn one is this big off camber downhill. Like you just crazy going down both bikes. Uh, the whole thing G's all the way out going up this hill into turn two druids. And you like go up and you're like, if you were to hold on, you would just sky it. Like it's insane. It's insane. Okay. What was your first oh shit moment in BSB? Like when you went, oh, this is different. First time is uh, Brands Hatch um, when we had the Yamahas, mixed conditions. Um, these guys, Alistair Seeley, I remember Alistair Seeley is a wily old dog, goes out <laughs> on inters, and I'm like, rains. Like everyone's rains. And they're like, dude, it's not rains. Like Seeley's like one second off, like qualifying pace in mixed conditions on inters. And I'm like, I want to go out on reins. And that was my oh shit moment to go. These dudes don't play around and I need to figure out how I'm going to ride in this stuff because this is what you race in. It would do. It was crazy. Like half the tracks wet, half dry, literally the inters there essentially like it's a slick, softer slick with just our uh, DOT uh, with just like one extra line in it. And they're like, it's an inter, but they're so good in the tracks they're so weird because they look wet but the it's like the um it's like uh it's not concrete it's like a really porous tarmac so like the water's underneath so actually it's dry on top but you can't see it it looks wet but it's not and so like these guys like josh brooks i remember and in, in my last year in, in keys <clears throat> Uh, or the first year was on Taiko Suzuki came from, he picked slicks. The track was drying and the races are like 35, 40 minutes. Yeah. And dude was like, 
18th and just started picking his way through, picking his way through. He's the only one on slicks. Dude, by like four laps to go, he was like five seconds faster than everybody a lap, three seconds faster, and just cutting people up, ended up winning the race. And like, that's the insanity. Like, <laughs> these guys are going out on slicks, you know, like 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 uh, Miller did at Argentina the one time. Yes. That's what it's like in DSB. It's insane. Oh, my God. How great is that? I love hearing stories like that, man. Now, what was it like to race for, like, Michael Jordan's team? Yeah, that was insane. Did you man. meet him? Was, did you meet him? Yeah, yeah, a couple of times. Yeah, what, he was what, really What was it he like? Was really cool. Yeah, he's really he's super down to earth. Like, because yeah, we were part of the team, he was just like, you're just a boy. It's not a big deal. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, uh, uh, it was pretty cool. I actually went to his 50th birthday party. Get, are cool. you serious? Yeah, I got invited because I was a part of the race team. And, I mean, that was insane. I'll tell you that. Like, just being around, like, you know, just every celebrity, you know. Oh. I'm just, like, walking around, like, dude. I'm, <laughs> like, and everybody's, like, six foot tall. <laughs> just everybody's basketball players. I mean, did, you have, did you, did you, did you geek out? I'm introduced as the crazy, like, hey, this is a motorcycle racer. Like, that's it. Like, and the craziest, coolest thing of my entire life was meeting Kobe Bryant. You know, and him kind of just uh, being super cool. Like, dude, you ride motorcycle. And we had, like, a pretty cool conversation about bikes and stuff like that. And, you know, of course, I'm sat like this. Like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You look like a kid over there. But um, <laughs> that was probably one of the coolest things. And, and, and just, like, it wasn't my best year racing, but the atmosphere. You know, Jordan, uh, Gemini, who ran the program, National Guard backed it, you know, to do it for, you know, a men and women you know, in the armed service was really cool. Um, and the fact that like, just all like kind of the cool things, like I still got like six brand new sets of Jordans. Like I got really <laughs> retros in a box. I got spike leads. Like, dude, oh my got God. boxes of stuff come at any time. Like it was really cool, man. It was, a, it was a really amazing experience that, you know, like times like this right now, I'm like, that was so cool that I could ride for like the legend, you know, like Michael Jordan, you know, and just kind of, I don't know, be like a little sliver in time to be in that, you know? How did you not get kicked out of that party? If that was me, you know me, I've done you that way. Like, oh my God, he's a motorcycle racer. And you're like, how old this guy? And, and if that was me in Michael Jordan's 50th birthday, racing for him, working for him. And then you're at the party with all these celebs. Like, how did you not like go, okay, just, just don't say the wrong thing. Like, how did you get through that? Uh, dude, just like, you know, I don't know. Like, just play it cool. <laughs> just play it cool and just like, just act like you're supposed to be there. No, oh, that's great. I, you know, I was supposed to be there. So the thing is, like, uh, you weren't, there's no public allowed. So everybody was super reserved. Like, if you were there, you were supposed to be there. So nobody was like, hey, man, what are you doing? Like, it was like, oh, he's cool. Like, he's cool. He's with Jordan. Like, everybody was just there. It wasn't a big deal. Did, did, he, ever ha did he ever have, like, a, a talk with them one-on-one -on -one about the mental game? Uh, no really it was never no we never really like you know it was my interactions with him were always just like upbeat positive like you know you know good luck or before we go out or like when he's in the box coming up saying what's up you know things of that nature um i would just say like he was always so cool to me you know and i was always with my buddy jason pridmore he was the guy who actually introduced me to mj uh, yeah. for the first time before i even rode for him and kind of really was the pioneer of me going up that pathway um, and yeah, I would say I never had a really a bad experience and, you know, it was really, really cool. Like that whole experience was just, it was insane. It's kind of like, uh, you know, and not a lot of people know, you know, not a lot of people know. So it's kind of cool to talk about it, but I don't really put it out there. Like yeah. it was, you know, it was just one of them things and I was just cool to be a part of it. Here's something I didn't know about you. Didn't you set some land speed records in Bonneville? Yeah, so I did that for a brief time, you know, with Charlie uh, Benton over at Cycle Dynamics. We put together this crazy long 650 twin um, he built, and yeah, we smoked the records. What was we the record? What was, what, what was the speed? What was the speed? I want to see it was like, oh, it, was one, it was either 163 or 173 or something like that. I don't know. Maybe it was a little bit more, but it was like uh, yeah, on a V-twin. So, like, it was pretty fast, uh, if I remember right. Like, it was fast. <laughs> um, I know we smoked it. Yeah. But it was, uh, 
I don't know. It was, it was, I just done so many things and you don't like until the crazy thing is until I did the doc, I didn't realize how bad of a situation it was until I talked about it until I went back and went, Oh man, we hit, we did do that. We did drive 6,800 miles in this silver bullet and, you know, sleep on the cat, you know, like on the bench seat and like, I don't know, like, you know, built our own Kawasaki in you know, two days. We didn't even dine on our bike before like, <laughs> home. Like, all those things. Like you start coming back and you're like, I, you know, I was in Arizona with my buddy, Ryan Wells and like having no money and having, you know, a good buddy of ours that owns an appliance store, Jeremy here go, Hey man, I'm gonna send you 500 bucks, get you through, you know, like those are the type of people you can't forget, you know, and yes. those are the type of people that would be in the impact of, you know, it's so hard. Like you go on a podium after like on the Harley and you're like, you have the people that are helping you now, but it's like all these people need had need the recognition because I wouldn't be here without all them, you know? That's the beauty of it. Like I said, man, that's the beauty of it. You've been to the lowest and then that little help here, that little help there. And now look at you now. And and looking at your resume, I think it, it's almost remiss that I'm going to put you like I'm, I'm going to ask you, where would you put yourself in? the history of American road racers, not named Hayden or Spees. If you, you think you're top 10, you think you're top two. I mean, honestly, if, 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 what you've accomplished and what you're still accomplishing, like you're still in it. I mean, you still have, you still have some, some, some more in you to go. Yeah. I mean, it's hard to put a number on yourself. Cause you know, you got, you don't want to disrespect people like Cameron Bobier, girl off, you know, who are still competing, you know, but I was a, kind of the first pioneer to go me and PJ. PJ was a little bit in front of me. Uh, but then it was like, I went over to seas and I was like, I'm out. See ya. Five years later, I come back because I chose to come back. Not Cause I, you know, couldn't stay. Um, I mean, it just depends how you look at it. Like, you know, you got Cameron who's won what five championships, you know, I think, I think his best years are coming and yeah. I think his, you know, no disrespect to him. I think his, uh, you know, people are going to look at him for these next couple of years bigger than his fourth fifth and whatever championship because they expect it and right. you know he's a phenomenal talent he's showing it already and he's doing it already so i got nothing but respect for the guy but you know american road racing when you're on a factory yamaha you know competing against a factory yamaha and you know one suzuki you know it's not like competing in moto two with 24 dudes that are willing to chop your head off. Yeah. And so I think that he's going to get a lot more respect and a lot more uh, a, a recognition and accomplishment uh, for his next couple years than he probably will he did for winning whatever championships he did in America. Just how I would, you know, I see it. Um, Joe Roberts, phenomenal. Um, Garrett Gerloff over, you know, jumping on an M1 you know, and being as quick as he was. I mean, these guys are top dudes. So it's kind of hard to be like, you know, but I raced against most of them. You know, I did it. JD Beach, you know, a phenomenal two time or yes, he is champion. So, you know, I don't want to disrespect anybody and put my name in somewhere where that somebody goes, uh, you know, so because it's too hard to quantify, you know, like if you go by championships, I'm definitely lower than those guys because I won, you know, super sport championships. But if you go on, hey, you know, who, stuck their neck out the earliest and the fastest i would say i was probably the one of the first um you know i'd say pj was up there i followed suit and you know going into an unknown with no safety net yeah i would say i'd be pretty high on the list i was thinking the same thing when i'm looking at your resume i'm like man this guy i mean i don't agree i'm wrong i've always respected you and i knew what you what you did but when i looked at everything and the one that stood out to me was the bonneville i was like this guy has done it all and like you said people don't realize when you go overseas that's a whole different ball game man i mean that's a mm -hmm. whole different talent level and so you have done it all man and i mean it from the bottom of heart and it's not to be i would honestly I, and there's been a lot, and I'm going to put you in the top at least, at least, no disrespect to you, at least top 15, at least. Yeah. At I least. Mean, I, have there. I know I have, like, the talent of all the other guys, you know, yeah. and it's just, you know, finding the right opportunities and the right timing. Timing's huge. What I do know is that what I learned over and overseas, if I came back to American road racing, I'd be a different animal than I was. Just like I showed last year in Dirt Track, um, 
they race very, very, and Cameron knows it from his old uh, uh, Red Bull Rookies Cup. Red Bull Rookies, you know. So he's he knew that how to how to his mind, you know. And it's different racing, man. They attack. They yeah. know how to attack, and they don't like over in road racing. You know, in America, you know, there's you get like kind of this soft, like, hey, it's fifty degrees out. You know, we're gonna kind of sit out ten minutes. Over there, it's like. <laughs> it's raining in 50 and they're like as soon as the green flag drops they're <laughs> out the door putting in laps yeah and that's the biggest thing i learned was like whoa yeah. i gotta get out there and nobody cares about really crap i mean they do but like like you're there to push like you're there to crash you're there to you know uh push to envelopes in practice fp1 fp2 fp3 qualifying like that's the name of the game over there. And if the, if I've never seen so many like lap records tumble in my five years there. And it was like, how can you go any faster? Bang. Alton park, another lap record. Excuse me. Bang. Another person. It's like, how, how is it going this much? The track hasn't changed. How is it getting faster? And like, you know, you go against Jack Kennedy in super sport and he's like third lap out at Olton Park, 1.6 seconds faster than you, and you're like, always <laughs> just chipping away, just chipping 1.2, 0. 0.8, 0. 0.5. And I mean, he it's just one of them things, man. Those guys in England especially, like anybody who goes to England, I just say you go into a death trap because you get like a guy like Michael Rudder, who's an old boy, been around for a long time, and you're like – you know, this fast, young, up-and-comer, you go there, and he just comes, you know, he's, what, 50-plus years? I don't know. Is he 50 yet? And he just comes blowing by you at Olton Park, and you're like, this old man just so <laughs> That is a tough pill to swallow. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It reminds me of a track day I had. I had a track day in, um, it was, no, it was a Yamaha Racing School in New Jersey. And I'm thinking I'm doing pretty good. And this dude on a cafe racer, 60-year-old dude, passes me going into the corner. And I'm like, I ain't shit. And then it makes so bad. I knew he was 60 because he told me when we got into the garage. He goes, man, I'm 60 years old. I go, you know what, man? I don't need to hear all this shit. I was so mad at myself and him. I'm like, okay, man. I'm just trying to get it down, right? <laughs> he had to tell me that shit. But it's a cafe racer, a two-piece leather suit. Not the one-piece. I'm thinking I'm doing all, you know, I got the one-piece. Look at all sexy and shit. And he's got the two-piece leather. And and he passed me on a cafe oh. racer. Yeah. So I know the feeling. <laughs> yeah, dude, it's crazy. These guys, they just know the tracks, man. They just know it. It was crazy. But I learned so much there. Like, I learned how to ride in any condition. I learned how to not go backwards in a race. I learned how to attack always and do some really like, kind of creative, a lot of race craft. Um, yeah. And like, just kind of deal with the elements and deal with being away. I mean, you know, like England's cool because it's like the same language and stuff like that. But it's when you're waking up and it's like six hours before you can talk to anybody back in America, it gets lonely, you know. Yeah. And it took me a long time until I met friends over there to really like embrace it. Okay, you're at a great place now. 2020, flat track champion. Life is good. You know, you made your way up. And are you racing this year? I'm sure I'm, 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 I'm going to go on the ledge and say that, you know, you're going to take it again. Uh, my money's on you. It really is. I mean, it, don't get me wrong. That's great talent. Money's on you. But what if, what if somebody came from, let's just say, World Superbike, had a great package. You knew they had a great package, great money. I mean, this is a team. This is a winning team. And they said, we want you to be our guy. And what would you do? Would you take, the, would you take that ride? I it would seriously consider it. You know, I have a huge love for road racing still. And I think that, you know, the biggest thing stopping me there is, is that, uh, um, you know, just having the right ride and the right time, you know, road racing is a little bit cutthroat right now where it's like, they, you got a year contract six months through, they're trying to dump you and just, it's not cohesive. It's not a good team. Whereas like the latest motors team I have right now is so nice. Like, it's like, uh, you know, they were in American road racing here for a long time, a race against George and they just know how to keep everything really nice to spend the money in all the right places. And, you know, it'd be a hard team to leave. Um, but I think like, if you put an opportunity like that in front of me, yeah. you'd kind of be a no brainer. Like if it was a Paul bird, you know, Ducati and BSB and Hey, I'm going to give you a year. You're going to make a hundred grand. I'm not going to, I'm not going to turn that down. Like you're going to get on the best bike to kind of show what you can do. 
would be a hard thing to turn down. But I will say it's 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 tough because I'm I'm really good. I've got uh, you know I'm really good with Harley Davidson right now. I'm great with the team. You know I'm really big in this in the in this sport as in like I'm very I'm on the influential side helping you know take some you know, media and help bring some international viewers and stuff like that. So it'd be very hard to leave. You know, this is like my blood. I've always wanted to come back here. Um, so it'd be a tough one, but I would seriously consider it. Uh, and uh, we'll just play it by ear. <laughs> All right. Well, let's go. Let's go. One word answers before we get out of here. One word answers. Yeah. One yeah. word answers. OK, if you had to pick gun to your head, had to pick life on the line, flat track, road racing. Does it matter? Just one year, any year? Flat track or road racing? Okay, now I cocked it. Flat track or road racing? No questions asked. Guns to your head. I just cocked it. Flat track or road racing? Make a decision. Probably road racing. Okay, okay. Best American rider ever that you've seen. Best American rider that you've seen. And it doesn't be famous. There doesn't be a champion that you've seen personally. Like, this is the best rider I've ever seen. American road rider, road racer. Nikki Aiden. Okay. Okay. Best that I've, that I've met personally, yeah. Okay. Okay. Best road race you think ever? Or, 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 or international America, whatever. The best road race you've ever seen ever. I'm going to go cliche and go Rossi. Like Okay. Were you always a Rossi fan? Always, but I, just on the fact, I know it's one word, but He's done it in multiple manufacturers. I knew, I knew you'd cheat. Knew, yeah. Multiple manufacturers <laughs> over three, you know, how many generations he's gone again. I think Marquez yeah. will be it and is, but it's you can't discredit that he's raced against he's raced against like three generations. <laughs> like, and and wow. still competitive. It's not just right. He's still competitive and he's still trying to get better. You know, he's not sitting on his laurels. He's got a new team, a satellite team. And he's saying, you know what? This, I, this is the first time I felt like a racer in a long time. I mean, I think he's going to have a, a great year personally. Dude, sometimes you got to step out of the factory deal. To, you know, <laughs> I mean, he's got a point to prove. Yeah. 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 And five years from now, where's James Rispoli going to be? Five years from now, you'll be, what, 35? 34, 35? 34. 34, okay. Yeah. Five years from now, where are you going to be? Five years from now, James Rispoli is going to be? I'll either be winning uh, Grand National Championship in flat track or be on a road race bike or selling real estate. <laughs> <laughs> That's not a one-word answer. Why are you always know. cheating? What are you Wait, I don't, how do you one word that is? How do you one word that? You say one word. Where are you gonna be five years? You say I'm a champion in boom. Oh, yeah, champion five track. No. <laughs> <laughs> hey, uh, do, uh, on the real, on the real, on the real. Do you really want to sell houses? No, I don't. <laughs> you know what's funny is I saw your Instagram and I go, man, I mean, part of me was like, man, at least this guy's got a plan for the future, blah, blah. And I know that feeling. And I've been to the point where I've almost been out of this business, out of comedy. And, and I knew and I was making my resume like a regular resume. And I literally had tears in my eyes. My heart was breaking as I was doing it. because I couldn't find a way out like you. And that's why I connected with you. It sounds cheesy as fuck, but it's the truth. I I just felt like, man, you know, my dream is always up. It's like, it's like you. All you've known was racing. You've raced your whole life. And when it's almost taken away from you, and I just set myself like, all right, this is not working. And I'm making a resume out. I, and I'm going, and I'm literally just crying making it. And that's oh, where yeah. I connected with you. So it's like, when I saw you say in real estate, I go, this dude don't want to know goddamn real estate. <laughs> Listen, man, like you, I've never had a plan B ever. So to have it is great. And eventually... Here's where I'm at in my career right now yeah. is like, I'm just kind of, I'm, you know, I'm at the age where I'm a little bit like, uh, you know, I don't want to be taken advantage of by team owners or anything anymore. Yeah. I'm a fair person, right. you know, like my team owner now, George is one of the most fair people I've ever met. Yeah. Um, but I don't want to be at the will of them anymore. Like you have to ride for no money, but you know, the mechanic is getting 45 grand, like, that just doesn't make sense to me and I'm not going to do that anymore. So like if <clears throat> I'll work and do whatever it takes, but I mean, I'm not, I'm not going to be at the, you know, leisure of a team owner and get, you know, screwed and, you know, go down that path again. So for me, like if I got to step into real estate or another piece of business, I'm going to be in business. 
when I'm done racing. Yeah. Uh, whether that's in one year or five years or, you know, I, until I'm 40, maybe I win championships and I hang around. But I will be in the business. I will, you know, build a business and do things of that nature just because that's who I am. You know, it's how I was brought up and that's what I'm really good at. I'm good at doing stuff like that. But I'm not there yet. Yeah. Well, that, no, no, that, that thing gets beautiful, man. It's like in your heart of hearts when you go, okay, it's time. But until then, if that passion still burns bright, the hell would everybody do that shit, man? Like you found a way. Like, and, and that's what I'm saying, man. You've been to the the lowest depths. And now, man, it's it's just like I said, I want everybody to win. And everybody can relate because I don't care, man, woman, child, no matter what your race, it, creed, color, religion, whatever, is that we're all human beings. And human beings connect on that level. Agreed. Agreed. I totally agree with that. It doesn't matter. You can just, if you want it, you can get it. Like it's harder, but you can do it. You know, like that's just the difference is like, it's life, man. That's yeah, life for everybody. I mean, what is hard for somebody might be easy for me, but what's easy for them might be, it's, you know, hard for me, you know, it's just one of those things, you know, it's just, you got to pick where you want to be. And you know, I'm a true believer. My dad's always taught me, if you want it, go find somebody who's done it and ask them yes. how to do it. And they will tell you how to do it. More than Nobody wants to die not telling somebody what how, what they've done. Yes. How to do it. Because they want to see it. No matter if it's competitor or not, 98% of people, unless they're just super ego driven, um, you know, it's like, they're going to tell you, hey, let's go in this direction. All right, I'm there. You know, and that's kind of how we've done it. What's your greatest trait? The greatest trait you have? Uh, charisma. <laughs> no, I think it's beautiful. It's honest. It's beautiful. I mean, honest. I laugh, but it's the truth, man. You have that it. You know what I mean? You have that it factor where you're fun, you're everything. But like you said, when that helmet gets on, man, it's go time and you're there. But at the same time, when you're on a podium, you can't help but go, I like this guy because you got personality and it's authentic and it's real. And that's what and I, I think that's what draws people to you, man. And I mean that. Yeah, and I, I mean, there's nothing worse than like one thing I got to say is like you just don't fake it. Like I don't fake it. It's just who I am. Yeah. You know, I want to be a little bit loud and like I want people to be like, like cheering like i want that you know but that's what key taught me is how to get through the camera like you know you don't speak to the camera you got to speak to the whoever's on the other side of the camera and he's the one who really taught me how to get through the camera of that because we were the same people person you yeah. know and uh that was big for me to learn that i learned that in bsb with eurosport is how to get through to that and it's translated over to here um but you know it's is nothing worse than you come off racing bar to bar with somebody over hundred mile an hour. And you're like, yeah, the race was good. Lap three, you know, tire went off and uh, yeah, I mean, it's a pretty tough race. Like nobody wants that dude. You just almost died. Like, let's go. Like what happened? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Like, hey. You're not going to answer that if somebody's chasing you with a knife. Let's go. And honestly, and that's why you, people gravitate to you in a good way because people can see through bullshit. You know, that uh, first of all, I thank the Lord. Well, thank the Lord. You were out partying last night. I was with you, you know? So it's yeah. like they can see through the end with you. It's just you're the type of guy where, man, I want to have a drink with that guy. I want to buy that guy a drink or, man, I want to have a hang out or just talk to the dude. And that's why it comes through. So, man, I can't thank you enough for doing this. Like, I always, always, wanna, always try to start off by apologizing. Like, listen, I know I was annoying when you met me, but it, but in my defense, it's sincere. You know what I mean? I'm a grown ass man who's like who's like 16, like oh my god, there's a racer, and I see you at the bar going, hey, what's up, James? <laughs> I know you had to be like, who is this guy? But I say that, but it's me. And so when I hit you up, man. I was so happy that you said yes. I mean, honestly, I mean it from the bottom of my heart. And when I saw that, if you guys get a chance, watch the American Dream on YouTube. I guarantee you, you will be inspired from that because he, you hold no punches back about it, how it was your fault in some places, and you had to fight your way back and where you're at. So if you want to be inspired, watch the American Dream YouTube. It's 40 minutes, but I guarantee you, from the bottom of my heart, you will be inspired to get up and do something with your life. James Rispoli, I can't thank you enough for this. And honestly, I'm a fan 
playing for life and I want to see you win another championship and I want I want us to do the eight hour Suzuka and I want to act like I know what I'm doing and I'm going to pay my way. Yes. <laughs> No, dude, I'm in. Thank you so much for having me. This has been a blast, man. And uh, yeah, I mean, that's so cool. If people do want to check it out, The American Dream, it's on the American Flat Track YouTube page. Uh, yeah, you know, the cool thing is, is you get inspired and you try to inspire people, right? And that's Exactly. And exactly. so if I can inspire two, three people that can do their own thing and then help other people, sweet. You know, it's I just appreciate it. Thanks for giving me a mouthpiece here. Um, you know, I really appreciate coming on and I, this has been phenomenal. I really, really enjoyed it. And, and I mean this from the bottom of my heart anytime, dude. Any, you hit, you hit me up anytime you want to come on. I will make a time for you because, man, what you did for me, and I appreciate that. I mean that. So, man, I feel like we're bonded from here on out, man. Okay. Seriously, you got me inspired. I think I'm going to go buy me a dirt bike. I'm on the fence on it. I think I'm just going to get me a dirt bike. I know. At this age, I should be trying to think about maybe use my AARP card to, you know, to give me some life insurance. But I think I'm going to get me a dirt bike. I'll be go first. <laughs> Dirt bike first. So anyway, James, man, again, have a great season this year, man. You're one of my I, honestly, I've always been a fan, even more of a fan. The American Dream, if you guys get a chance, watch it. Man, good luck. Thank you so much. Thank you guys for watching Tales from a Gemini. And like we say about this time, pay.